we're back. Welcome to the Digging Deep ATV MX Podcast with your host, two-time defending ATV motocross national champion, Cody Jensen. Am I on air? What's up, everybody? We're back. I'm your host, Cody Jansen, and welcome to episode 55 of the Digging Deep ATVMX podcast, presented by our title sponsor, CST Tires, available for purchase at shop.csttires.com. We have a special one for you tonight. This is the story of a guy battling and beating now legend Joel Hetrick for a Pro Am championship and then continuing that battle the following season as the duo made their rookie debuts in the pro class. As an AMA ATV Pro Class rookie, this rider grabbed a handful of top five finishes, finished on the podium multiple times, won a pro moto, and battled for the win at the season finale. But just as quickly as he entered professional ATV racing, he was gone. He went from battling for wins as a rookie in 2011 to absent from the series in 2012 and beyond. And as you'll hear him say, he sometimes wonders what if, just like many ATV motocross fans still do to this day. This is the story of Chase Snap. I want to quickly thank our sponsors. Thanks to CST Tires. Go to shop.csttires.com. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew. Valvoline, SSI decals, DID Racing Chain, Namira Technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV components, Impact Solutions, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, Four Works Carbon, DP Brakes, Gripped Gloves, Factory 43, Bike Strikes and Quads LLC, and Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Their clippers rock. Their nose hair trimmer is amazing, and they have some brand new industry-leading products that just hit the market as well. Full disclosure, the new Lawnmower 4.0 from Manscaped is my secret to keeping a perfect beard. This new electric trimmer is so nice that I've been using it only on my facial hair, but don't tell anybody else. So check out Manscaped. I wish I would have sooner. Get 20% off with free shipping by using code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Support all these great companies that support us, and for any products that fall through the cracks, click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner on our website to help us out. By accessing Rocky Mountain from our specific link, we get a percentage of that, and we both know you need parts and gear. So this is the easy easiest way to help us out. No matter what off-road gear or parts you need, Rocky Mountain ATV MC has you covered. So before you buy, click that Rocky Mountain ATV MC banner on our website to help us out in a major way. We can't thank you enough for that. This week's Impact Solutions Impact Moment, where we highlight something good and positive going on in the sport. It might be brief and it's a follow-up from a few weeks back, but it's the most important message we could ever cover. I was at a track this weekend and a dad of a little racer said to me, as long as he tries hard, he does his best and he treats his equipment with respect. I don't care if he's first or last. I'll say it one more time for the people in the back. Have fun, do your best, never throw your helmet, and the rest will all fall into place. Our Impact Solutions Impact Moment. Now, the 30-second board is up, it's sideways, and the gate is down. Time to dig deep. Let's go. All right, guys. I'm so stoked to talk to tonight's guest. His story is a a crazy, unique one. He was wildly successful before his career came to a quick and abrupt end. And still to this day, I find myself wondering what if when it comes to this guy. Brought to you by SSI Decals, making your identity stick with championship level graphics. Check out SSI's new and improved website today at SSIDecals.com. Say hello to former Pro-Am production national champion and pro class moto winner and podium finisher, which he all did in his rookie season which is truly incredible mr chase snap what's up man thanks for uh, agreeing to do this welcome to digging deep thanks cody i'm excited to be on here this is something i've been wanting to do for a while we've been talking about it for i think a year now and i know how it goes every you know mm-hmm. everybody's busy and trying to put all the pieces together um but I'm just super stoked to be on here and and talk a little bit about quad racing back in the day for me yeah so 
I hinted at it a little bit. Your story is an impressive one and I'm excited to tell it because for people that weren't around 10 years ago, it may almost be hard for them to believe. And I wanted to get you on, like you said, dating back to kind of when I started this podcast, knowing you had a a good story to tell, a cool story to tell, a unique story to tell. And I believe uh, we even discussed it briefly, like you said, probably dating back a year ago. But uh, like you said, things got crazy. They remained crazy. You know how it goes. Um, But then fast forward to a few weeks ago and Casey Greek made a comment about Jeffrey Rastrelli being one of the few to ever beat Joel Hetrick as an amateur. And honestly, Chase, you instantly came to mind for me. And and lo and behold, uh, you quickly hit me up with an objection, all in good fun, of course. And it just seemed like uh, now was the perfect time to get you on. Yeah, for sure. That was, I think I was, I don't know, I was doing some housework, doing some, I don't know, dishes or something (laughs) and uh, had my AirPods in, just listened to the podcast. And that happened. I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) <laughs> He's forgetting somebody because <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've beat him a lot or I know I have. It, well, and, uh, it, that's Casey, when I messaged you and yeah. I was not, you know, wouldn't, didn't upset me at all. Uh, I just thought it was funny. And that's why I was like, Hey, we can talk about this. Well, and Casey was just as in the mix at that time. Right. I mean, he was Natalie's mechanic and whatever at that time. So he was right there. Uh, must've just been a, must've just been a slip up there for him. Yeah. And so I actually talked to Darren, Darren Thomas, that was my mechanic back in the day. He actually ended up being Joel's mechanic after I retired. Yep. So he, you know, I, and I, I live two miles away from him. We talk all the time Okay. and I brought it up to him and he's like, well, you know, he knows Casey. Well, they worked together, you know, after me and stuff. And he said back then he was new to the ATV world. He was a dirt Mm -hmm. bike guy when he came in. Yes. And he was like, you know, he was in Natalie's mechanic and he, you know, he focused on the pro class. He didn't probably even barely watch pro-am, but then as the years went on, you know, and then he had his relationship with Joel and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, he really didn't even know, you know, notice, but. Right. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, we'll get into that a little bit. We'll get into your battles with Joel Hattrick later in your career, but I want to take it from the top. I want to be able to, um, give you the opportunity to tell your racing story here. So starting from the beginning, how, and when did you get into, uh, riding and racing? Uh, I started riding when I was six. Uh, first four wheeler was a Yamaha Badger. Okay. And then I went to the Yamaha breeze. And then when I was, nine i think begged and begged and begged my dad for a blaster okay me and my brother both got blasters and it was like the best day ever (laughs) and we just we had trails at my house and we 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 actually made some jumps with shovels you know just anything we could do Mm -hmm. and uh how i got started racing was a neighbor across the street he had a 250r and so he'd come over and ride with us and he was going to local track and said hey you guys should come out and watch my dad took us, and then the next week we were there. He, my dad loved it, and he he has a background in racing. He raced sprint cars and stuff. Sure. And so it was like he was hooked. He was like, I can take these boys racing. <laughs> and uh, so I started racing at ten on a blaster, and I was racing against ran the beginner class at the local track, and so I was racing against adults on four hundred EXs and Z four hundreds, and it was really chaos. It was it was looking back kind of scary. <laughs> uh, but I did that for a couple of years and then, you know, you know how it is just meet people and they're like, Hey, you should come race here. Yeah. So, so we started racing a regional series, uh, called TQRA mm-hmm. down in Texas and Oklahoma. And, uh, then we quickly, you know, just started meeting people and then it just one thing led to another. Um, and so like the Miller brothers, you know, they were, when we yeah. first started racing down there, they were the, you know, everybody looked up to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we just started doing that for a couple of years and then I, I won a championship for that series in the blaster class mm-hmm. and, you know, it just, the ball kept rolling. Just keeps we, going. We tried, then, then we went to a national in Texas. I think that was Oh six maybe, or somewhere okay. in there. Okay. And I remember being amazed by the pros, like, this is crazy. And uh, that- Joe bird, you know, with his, his fifth wheel, it was wrapped and his, you know, it was just crazy to me. 
that was the um, that was the heyday back then yeah and and it's mm-hmm. funny you, you brought up the the blaster um i thought i saw a picture of i uh, looked up a picture today i stumbled across a picture today of you on the the red and black blaster and i had one just like that i loved my blaster so much back then and um it's it's funny how you know, uh, it, it just, it happens so fast, like you said, and then you had the advantage of having that TQRA series down there. Cause that was a really good series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That actually was my brother. Cause was the it red really? black blaster. Yes. Yeah. I think if you Google it, like it pops up somehow, but, uh, it, that said, cause it, because... said, it says your name on the picture. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, funny. I had a blue one. So okay. I had, I got blue and he got the black and red and that's kind of like, <laughs> so we were different you know okay gotcha yeah yeah there's a picture and it said it was you and uh it's red and black and and he's doing a a no footer so i'm like (sighs) i was gonna keep that in my back pocket for like a like a throwback picture but uh if it's Corey, then um we'll have to give him the credit instead (laughs) that's funny because we have that same exact picture somebody blew it up on like a banner thing and it's okay to this to this day it's in Corey's office on his wall (laughs) that's funny that's funny i I give we give him crap about it but Mm -hmm. everybody you know everybody has those old pictures that you can laugh at. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. So my first, and I don't want to skip too much, uh, over too much time here, but my first memories of you were in 2007, I think in the B class. Um, I think it would have been WPSA at the time, which was the series to, to race at the time. And the crazy part to me, um, and again, I don't want to skip over any time here. So, so we can fill in that blank ahead of time. But when I think back to 2007 and I still remembered this as I sat down to kind of prep for this interview here was that you won that championship that year in the B class by two points over your brother. So tell me about that. Um, Actually, I don't want to say you're wrong, but I did not win that championship. Seriously, I actually got hurt. Yeah, I got hurt um, at the end of the season, or actually the last round of. Can't remember the name of the track in Pennsylvania. Yeah, ple- it was um, pleasure. They held uh, the banquet. It was at that race. Field of Dreams. Yep, yep. I can remember because I rode all the way home. It was like an 18 hour drive. Okay. Uh, with a broken collarbone and was super uncomfortable. But yeah, Seriously? I, I crashed. So- yeah. So, so uh, to vouch for myself for one second here, I looked up the results from the championship today and it said you won. So really? Uh, yeah. So, huh. so that's so, crazy. So fix that for me. What, what the hell happened there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was up there battling uh, for the, for the points most of the season. Okay. There was a few guys, me, my brother, yep. uh, Austin Mosier, yep. Yep. older brother, mm-hmm. uh, Randy Richmond, which was a good friend of ours from Arkansas. Okay. Um, I can't remember who else, but yes, sure. you're correct. 2007, we raced WPSA and mm-hmm. our first national, um, I think we went to Loretta's in 05 okay. and I raced the blaster class and I, I borrowed a, a blaster from a local kid because mine honestly was, was not that great. Okay. Um, and this kid had a very nice one. He was like, Hey, you can, his dad said, Hey, you can take this and race it. And I'm like, heck yeah, this thing's way better than mine. So I took it, never even practiced on it, just took it and raced it. Okay. And I got smoked by, um, I think Richard Lindsay. Um, I can't remember all those guys, Bobby Maisie. Yeah. Um, Eddie, Eddie Edmondson was probably in it back uh, then. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Um, so we probably raced against each other at some point there then maybe because I have, was- I was, I was at Loretta's that if it was Oh five, I raced up my blaster at Loretta's that year and same thing. I thought I was going to go down there. Cause I had gotten fifth at red Bud earlier in the year. So I went down there thinking, Oh yeah, like I'm going to do good. And I got waxed. I got like 15th or something. I mean, I got smoked. Yeah. No, I was blown away. <laughs> I, I went there with like thinking I was going to win. Yeah. I mean, cause around like the TQRA, like that was, we were a very competitive class and I raced against the guys I was battling with um on 300s and to me it's a, you, they had a little bit of an advantage and so i felt like I'm, I'm gonna go here and do good and then i was like wow <laughs> and but really i was I, I would get blown away off the starts and i'd come from like 15th and work my way up race up sure um yeah so we raced that that was the only national that year and i think in 06 we did um the texas one at oak hill okay yep and then my dad that's kind of when he started like okay we need to we need to start doing nationals okay in 07 
we were going to do the nationals, but I think they started a little earlier. I think that year is when people would run a couple of the nationals and then they all switched to WPSA. Then go WPSA because WPSA started later. Yep. Yep. And my dad last minute, he's like, I think we should do this series because it starts later. Well, the backstory is we're in the swimming pool business and the winter time is very slow Mm -hmm. and you know, we're scraping by through the winter basically. Sure. And, uh, and so, you know, it's very expensive. So he was like, you know, we should do this series because, you know, by the time it starts, you know, we can afford it a little easier. Right. So that's yeah. what we did. Okay. And turns out we made the right choice. Like that series was, that's where everybody was at. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the, you look at the, the nationals that year and it was like nothing compared to what it used to be. Okay. So we raced that, mm-hmm. um, had a blast, but I was just inconsistent. I had good races, you know, I, I think I won a couple of them, but then I'd crash out or, you know, had okay. a DNF. We, at that time we weren't on the best equipment. I mean, we, we were doing the best we could. We were using a local bike shop that helped us out. Um, yep. but it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of the guys that we were racing against, you know, Bobby Gifford had a, a full Baldwin bike that he was racing and, mm-hmm. and he ended up being a good friend of ours. So, uh, that was cool, but I felt like we were a little, behind the eight ball on our equipment side. Sure. Um, but yeah, so then we did that. And then the following year, 08, we did, yep. we did the nationals, but we skipped the first few races for the same reason. Okay. As I just mentioned. Sure. Yeah. And so, I want to, and I want to touch on before you get too far ahead, but the, the cool thing. So whether, so obviously I, I had remember, I thought you won that B class championship in 07, even before I looked that up today. Um, but I still remembered, I swore, I remembered you as like the guy to beat in those class in that class, whether you won it or not. And the thing about WPSA back then for people that weren't around, cause that's the series I ran in 2007 too. And every class was so gnarly because there wasn't three B classes or three A classes for the talent to kind of spread out. There was, there was one B class with a hundred hundred people signed up in it. So when you won the B class, that was the gnarliest B class that there had ever been basically. Um, and for mm-hmm. you to be at the front of that class, um, uh, that was, that was, that was a really big deal. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I mean, it was, uh, to me, it felt like an A class. I mean, exactly. it was yep. very, very competitive. I because feel like that- as I moved on, looking back at the B classes, they seem weak compared to when we were, but Back which then. I mean, I guess that's kind of how it goes, but, <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, then, to me, it was like, yeah, I mean, you better then- bring your A game. Yep. And then the, the thing about the A class back then was the A class was basically pro-am you know, the way that mm-hmm. that works. Cause people, you could run a and pro-am, I think if I remember correctly with the WPSA. So, um, so those guys could double dip, but it, it just made all the classes that much gnarlier. And then the next aspect of your story, where you were going, that's why I wanted to stop you before you got to 2008, because that was part of your story that always stuck in my mind. You being a B rider in 2007 and in 2008, you jumped right to pro-am. Um, and I wanted to ask you before you got too far into that, what went into that decision? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. I mean, we are talking about 13 about, years ago uh, or so. Yeah. Um, I think it had something to do with, uh, cause we would still race the TQRA series, mm-hmm. you know, in between the nationals, the ones that we can fit in and stuff. Yep. And I think I had basically like gone to the next level there. Like I was like, you know, pro pro am speed at those, um, and so I think maybe that was the idea. I don't really know. Sure. Um, well, can't, that's cool. can't remember, but that's good to hear though, because you hate, I mean, you know, it, it always irks you when you see people that, you know, race the, the pro class quote unquote locally or the a class or whatever. And then they drop down at nationals. Well, you weren't doing that. You were doing it the right way. Like, like, you know, I did like, so many people that do it the right way, did it. If you race the fast class at home, now you went to the nationals and race the fast class. And that puts you on the fast track to being at the front of those classes in the years going forward. So, um, whatever, no matter what went into it, it was obviously the right decision. It sure seemed like it anyway. Yeah. I think that's, you're probably right there. I think I realized like I need to be racing with these pro guys locally, but, uh, I knew nationally I wasn't going to 
you know, I knew I was not going to go do good in pro-am, but I think deep down I was like, this will make me a better rider. Yeah. Um, if you look back at my results, I looked the other day and just kind of scanned through. Okay. And I'm like, man, that year in 08, I think I did 70% of the series yep. and uh, missed the first couple races. Mm-hmm. And I know there was a lot that I didn't even qualify in pro-am. And then there was some where I had like a 16th, a 17th, and Two top and by ten. the end of the two top tens that year by the end. Yep. Yeah. It, it was at, at the end, I think red Bud and Loretta's yep. yep. And it, that that's, that kind of started being consistent. If you look through then the next year, like it just, it was building. That was kind of my, yeah. But one thing that stood out to a lot of people and I, I can't explain it, um, is I'd have a bad injury and I'd come back. Like, I'd have three, four months off and then come back better than I was. And I don't know if it was mentally, just I was so fired up about coming back and sure. wanting to be better. Uh, but 2008, after the series was over, um, so that's 2008. This is, I want to bring this up. This is a huge turning point in my career was we hired Darren Thomas mm-hmm. in, I think, September, October of 08. Okay. And my dad basically was like, realized we needed a mechanic, our stuff was falling apart and especially with two especially with two fast riders it's not just you yeah yeah at that time me and my brother were both like equally our speed was equal and and to be honest we were hard on equipment i mean (laughs) i would i would broke everything (laughs) i ever had on live on those yamahas the yfz the earlier models Mm -hmm. um i think i went through three or four frames subframes they're just always breaking everything that's hey that's how i remember you most is on the the old school like the old style yellow yfz's that's how i think yep. of you and your brother we i think it was 40th anniversary yeah um it was the 06 model and my dad loved that and so that's what he bought the plastics for for our bikes and put and then we even yeah. had graphics made that matched the like yep. stock graphics mm-hmm. um so yeah it was cool because it was different too so it kind of yeah. stood out yeah those um, are cool looking but, bikes but this was the turning point. We hired Darren and I can remember, I was just like blown away. I could not believe we we're going to have a mechanic and we had a little meeting and basically his job was to show up at our house and prep our bikes. And if we're going to practice track, he's going with us. If we're going to Texas to race. He's going with us. And he, he only lived 10, 15 minutes away. Um, he was single at the time and it, you know, he was 25 years old, I think. So it just worked out good. So he was all and, in on uh, your program. He had nothing holding oh, him yeah. either. And yeah. he, had, he had just moved back from California. He had went out there and worked for Yoshimura. Okay. Uh, building engines for a short, I don't know, was a year or less. And okay. he said he hated it in California. So he moved back home. And that was, he was looking for a job and it just, it, it all fell into place. And uh, so that's the turning point. Basically, well, he got me into dirt bikes. He was a dirt bike guy. And sure. yep. So I buy a dirt bike and we, we build a track at my house and I'm, I'm getting pretty good on it. Well, then a buddy comes over with a 450. I had a 250 F and he's like, Hey, you want to ride my 450? And I'm like, sure. Well, I did not need to be on that 450. Okay. And long story short, I messed up case to jump, like frame cased it and flipped over the bars, got a concussion and broke my back. Oh, shoot. I uh, fractured. It was a compression fracture, uh, T seven. So it wasn't, Yep. didn't need surgery or anything, but I was in a, a back brace, like turtle shell yep. for a couple months. And, um, it was weird. As soon as I was healed up, Darren had me two brand new Suzuki's built with, with full JB, everything, okay. box shocks. And like, we had all kinds of people that just somehow, um, Oh, it was, it was Kevin, uh, from Lost Creek. We, we kind of built a relationship at the end of 08 with him. And so okay. him and Darren, kind of became friends and Kevin said, I want to help you out. It was when Mitch Reynolds had kind of, I think he had left the scene Okay. and Kevin had helped him out. So I think Kevin was like, you know, these are, this is somebody I can help out Yeah. and uh, to rep his business. Yep. And so we did, and he helped us out a lot because he was, you know, obviously with him being with Suzuki, he was, he was knowledgeable on everything and basically told Darren what we needed to do and, I remember riding that Suzuki and I was just like blown away. It was 10 times better than Yamaha. Compared and to what you were used to, that had to feel like twice the quad. 
Yep, for sure. I mean, it did feel goofy at first. Uh, I wasn't like instantly comfortable on it, but it was like after, you know, two weeks of riding it, it was, I feel like I probably shaved a couple seconds off my lap time instantly. Well, I feel like, you know, with that old, with the old, with the original first gen YFZ, it was so like long and narrow. And then the Suzuki was so square that I'm sure after you got used to it, like that thing had to, I mean, the handling on that thing had to be so next level. Yeah. Much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I can just remember coming into Oh nine and being, you know, last race, I I, I was barely in the top 10 in pro-am, but to me in my head, I was like, I'm going to be a top five guy and come in and I podium my first race in pro-am I think it was pro in production, not the unlimited. I, so I remember the correctly. Bigger of the two, really, is how you thought of it yeah. back then. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, so and I was, to- I was gonna, I was just gonna say, I knew that you had made that jump, and you can see it on paper that you made that jump in '09. Um, obviously, not knowing what what went on behind the scenes, but um, I guess I'll let you pick up there because you go on to have much more success, winning races and doing all kinds of stuff that season. So you can continue your story there. Yeah. And so back to the whole injury thing, like I had that bad injury and was, I didn't really ride at all through the off season. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I had maybe a month on, on the brand new quad and then went to the race and podium. Um, so I was like, I was kind of surprised, but then quickly I was like, this is where I belong. Like this is, you know, it's real deal. I got a mechanic. I got the best, you know, like felt like I had the best equipment. Um, so I expected the podium from then on out, but that year I was kind of, you know, Cody Gibson, he was like mm-hmm. unstoppable. Yep. Um, yeah, he came, but back. I was real, he came, he came back to pro-am then and did that to me in 2012. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I watched, I, I was real. That was the first year I was out of racing quads. And so I followed sure. like every, everything, but yeah. So from then on, I would, I felt like a podium guy, but I feel like it kind of, I don't know if I expected too much out of myself because I would I made a lot of mistakes. I feel like okay. I was inconsistent that year, um, but I was learning a lot. Um, and that was the first year we actually we started kind of staying on the road. You know, instead of living in Oklahoma, our closest race is Loretta's, which is nine hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we would race anywhere up north, we'd try to stay somewhere in between races. It wasn't, it wasn't and, feasible to go all the way home. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially, you know, with the gas prices and everything, it was, yep. it was cheaper and, yep. and then more beneficial. Yep. So that year, I believe that was, uh, the year I met Jeremiah Jones through, okay. um, people, I think Thomas Brown maybe introduced me to him. Uh, then we met big John that drove the Suzuki rig. Cause he would, he would park there at Jeremiah's in between races sometimes. Yep. Yep. And, that was also kind of a, I think I mentioned this the other day, kind of a turning point for me is getting to stay at Jeremiah's. Um, it was, I mean, his track was nothing fancy, It was, but it was a good practice track. And it's all you need. He basically though. like took me under his wing. I didn't even barely know him. I knew of him, you know, you know, I idolized him. Yep. So I was just like ecstatic to be there and, yep. and, uh, and then when he basically said, Hey, I'd like to help you out, um, you know, give you some, some tips, basically it wasn't like full-time writer, but he'd come out there and, and watch me and then pull me aside and say, Hey, you could work on this. You could work on that. Yeah. And, uh, so your post the other day, it really stood out to me. Cause I can remember Jeremiah tell me hit this corner and oh, come back and, he was, line choice. and he's yeah. like, look at like, you can see my tire marks. He's like, you see how you hit that corner looking at this way. And I'm like, Oh, I never even thought of that. And he would show me just certain corners, different ways to approach it and, and look at it differently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think that really helped me, um, you know, take it to the next level. Yeah. That guy, his, his ability to look and and just like you're saying, because it was only a, a few years after that or a handful of years after that, that I stayed with Jeremiah too. And same thing. It was like, he, kind of took me under his wing and was able to like the things that he can see by watching, uh, just looking at a racetrack or watching somebody ride it's next level. Like, I don't know how he, I don't know how he sees what he sees. Cause just like you said, mm-hmm. he sees stuff that 
isn't even there until he points it out. You know, it's, it's truly right. incredible. So, um, like you said, and I don't want, uh, don't want 2009 to go by without kind of hitting on what you ended up accomplishing there because you won a, a race in each of the two classes and in, in the two pro-am classes there, nine, uh, I'm sorry, eight podiums total and resulted in, uh, in, in third and fourth in the championship and pro-am production and pro-am unlimited respectfully. So that was a, that was a special year coming from the, the year before two top tens was all you had. And then to go, you know, eight podiums, uh, you know, a couple wins and, and be third and fourth in the class. Um, that was a pretty big deal, but it shouldn't come as a su- uh, surprise when you are saying all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes, you know? Mm-hmm. And then Oh nine, this will bring us into another topic that, um, we've talked about and you posted a picture of okay. was Loretta's Oh nine when I blew my front tire off the, off the rim. And, uh, I had a, I was, I was going for four for four on the two pro-am classes. Okay. And I basically had it at that point. That was the last moto and I'd won the previous three. And I was, I think I was, uh, I could be wrong, but I think I was in the lead when that happened. And I just, I said, I'm not quitting. Like I'm running this flat tire this whole race. Mm-hmm. And I can remember I go on a corner and it would, it would just pull me over into the, into the berm, pull me off the track. And then I get straight and take off. <laughs> and then the other, you know, turn the other direction. There were, it was no problem. It was fine. Yeah. 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 And, and I can remember, you know, I fell back to, I think 10th um, and salvage, I think a fifth overall, but I was so bummed because I wanted to win all four and make that statement, you know, leaving mm-hmm. like I'm the guy next year to beat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think still it, it still painted that picture to everybody. Absolutely. I remember you, uh, that, that totally had escaped me. And now that you say that, I remember you commenting on, on some of those pictures from back then and letting us know what was going on there. Um, so, so in 2009, you were beat out by Gibson, Cody Gibson and Bobby Ross in production, Cody Gibson, Josh Williams, and Devin Himes and unlimited. So coming into 2010, you were surely, you know, one of the odds on favorites, right? Just like you said, you were, you know, dominating at the end of the season there in 2009. Um, but prior to the season, you suffer a gnarly injury, right? That was that year. Um, so tell us, tell us that story. Yeah. So this is another dirt bike injury. <laughs> uh, you would think I would have not done the same what, thing, but would have the, got the, the memo. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as the season was over, I got back on my dirt bike and all my friends, most of my friends rode dirt bikes around here locally. Sure. And it was about that point where local tracks started phasing quads out and the numbers were dying out. Tracks started, you know, being dirt bikes only. And so I started riding dirt bikes in the off season and it was something new and challenging for me. And so mm-hmm. I would do that for a couple months or something just it was fun you know i go every tuesday night yeah i go every tuesday night to the local track um me and my buddies i had you know that little track at my house we'd we'd play on and stuff um but it was a it was just an afternoon we were practicing on a buddy's house and i crashed basically gooned out over this jump and crashed and the bike flipped and somehow the front brake um twisted up into the throttle cables and made it stick wide open and so then the bike lands on me and it's just like it's like a nightmare but the bike's on top of me wide open Mm -hmm. and the rear tire is burning into my thigh and i can't get the bike off me and all i had to push on was the rear tire and it was spinning so i pushed on it and got it off and i i got up and my leg felt like it was on fire and because it burned through my pants through my, uh, I didn't wear knee braces. I had like these knee pads, I guess you'd call sure. them. Okay. Through that, through the skin, looked like I had rubber on my leg. It was, it was that bad, but, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't even notice it, but I had pretty much cut my finger off. My pointer finger had gotten the spokes. And so my brother said, hop in the truck. We're going to the emergency room. He drove me instead of calling the ambulance. Okay. And it was about a 15 minute drive. And long story short, my finger didn't make it. And so they had to amputate it at the first knuckle. And uh, I think that was 
within six weeks or so of the first national 2010. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty and, close and because I remember, and I don't remember chase how I heard the news back then. I don't remember, but I remember hearing it and like, like, damn, that's not good. And then, I mean, you know, when, when racing starts, it's like, you didn't even miss a beat. So it's crazy. Yeah. So I raced one time before the first national, we went to a TQRA and my finger um, was so swollen. It wouldn't fit in my gloves. And so we had to cut off the, the pointer finger of my glove. Sure. And then, but that finger was super sensitive. So we were like wrapped gauze around it, taped it up and I raced and I can remember it throbbing. Like I'm trying to grip the handlebars and that mm -hmm. finger is just, throbbing like with every heartbeat just throbbing sure. and i ended up i had blisters so, so bad like the whole palm of my hand was a huge blister because my grip changed of course yeah and yeah so then we were struck we were battling you know then two weeks later was the first national so i was okay. trying to heal up my hand because it was so painful i could barely even hold on so i didn't ride the two weeks up until the race okay um i think that was alabama uh, pell city Mm -hmm. and so we show up and I, I still, I had to cut the finger out of my glove and then my leg was still not healed up. So we had to wrap it up and it's slightly above my knee on the inside of my thigh. And so okay. it would, it would rub against the tank and I can remember coming off the track and all that was down below my knee. Like it came off and it was nasty, but, uh, but I got on the podium and you can look back, there's a picture where I put up the number one and it was <laughs> that finger, which, Oh my gosh, which people, my friends started calling the nub. And then I got that nickname for a while. Nub. Okay. And to me now it's funny, but at first I didn't, I didn't really like the nickname. Wow. I don't know. I just, like nothing like kicking a guy while he's down. kind of. Right. You know? So but now I look back, I'm like, that's awesome. Right. So, it's, um, it's like I overcome that huge injury, still get on the podium. And so then I embrace it. Like, yeah. So, so was there like a feeling out process? I mean, you're saying that, you know, your grip changed and everything, but what about, what about, I mean, that's your clutch finger, right? It's on your left hand. So, yep. uh, so was, did that, I mean, that had to be difficult. I feel like that would be difficult for a person. Yeah. And it, it kind of changed my riding style a little bit. Um, started riding a little differently because, because I couldn't clutch it as well. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I was started, you know, cornering a little different that grip. Occasionally I'd become in a rough corner and my hand would come off the bars, which oh, you know, sure. is super sketchy. Of course. But yeah. I'm ultimately holding on with my thumb and my pinky and my ring finger. Okay. And then I have my middle finger for the clutch and that's it. Sure. And we actually yeah. had to, um, I believe we put in softer springs in my clutch Sure. to help me with that. Yep. Um, which later on we had to, actually go stiffer than normal because I would, I would burn up clutches. Burning really clutches. Bad. I was just going to say that yeah. if you, you, cause, cause a person puts in stiffer ones so that the clutch lasts longer. So to you to compensate mm -hmm. for your hand, go lighter totally makes sense. But I was going to say, you'd have to put a clutch in every moto. Yep. And so, and I believe we went to a slipper clutch that year. Okay. I don't know if it was 09 or 10. Okay. Um, but we had to go so stiff that I got to where I wouldn't even really use the clutch. I just learned to ride without needing it. Mm -hmm. And it's cause I, I had to, uh, my hand would start cramping, you know, trying to use the clutch. Sure. I didn't feather the clutch like most people. Definitely okay. not like Jeffrey Rustrelli. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot. Yeah. That's, that's crazy to think. Of. I never thought about that part of it. Um, but I was super curious to hear how, how you had to compensate for that injury there and knowing that it was, it was, I mean, right up close to the, to the beginning of the, the year there. But in my mind, like, like I said, you made it look so graceful, you know, it was like you, you know, you were right at the front right away with this thing, but behind the scenes, it was obviously a whole lot more hurdles than that. Yeah, for sure. I think it was all just in my head. I, I feel like, um, my mindset is, is what uh, gave me it. my success. I just, you know, I can be tired and just tell myself that I'm making it three more laps right. and, 
could do it. I don't know how, because nowadays it, it doesn't work that way. But, <laughs> it's so, it's so it's yeah. different when you're, when you're younger though, it's different when mm-hmm. you're younger and you have that, that mentality. It's like, that's the only thing in the entire world that matters right then, you know, and you get older yeah. and then there's other stuff to worry about. Yeah. It's crazy how it changes as, mm-hmm. as you get older. <laughs> you're exactly right. So Pro-Am was, was stacked, um, obviously that year, but it ended up really being a two horse race between you and, and Joel Hetrick there. Tell me about that year. That was a season that, um, featured some incredible battles between you two. Uh, I'm assuming the, the hand probably came around a little bit or you got used to it a little bit more. But um, that was a that was an intense summer of battles between you two. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if I remember correctly. Joel was on Kawasaki that year, mm-hmm. um, and he had some issues. I think he had a bunch of motor issues and had some DNFs and stuff. And so I had basically like a little bit of a, a cushion. And then they started figuring things out, and then all of a sudden he's there, like he's still there competing for the championship. And I can remember, it was almost like we would swap motos. Like he would beat me and then I'd beat him. And it was just like back and forth. And if you look back, I know you look back through the results. It's like first, second, first, second, occasionally, you know, a third or fourth. But it was like every other. Yeah. That season, it was like every other for you too. Yeah. When you look at the results. Yep. And it seemed to me like, I don't know on paper, but it seemed to me like if, if I won Prime Unlimited on Saturday, he'd win on Sunday or vice versa. Okay. Which was weird, but it was still cool though, because you still like, you get that feeling of you won. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't know, it's kind of weird, but in, in those, in, way it played out. yeah. In thinking back to how it was back then, the Pro-Am classes were in, when I say this, it's going to sound like it's a negative connotation, but they were glorified. Like, I feel like now pro-am today isn't as glorious or as like, you know, so much like the, the dirt bike lights class as it was back then, back then it was a, it was a really premier class. I feel like probably more than it is now, at least, at least that's how I thought of it back then. I mean, people stacked the fences to watch those pro-am classes, especially when it became down the stretch, it was you versus Joel. And it was like every moto, who's going to get the better of the other one, just like you said. So it was, it was must see racing back then. Yeah. And I think part of what made it that way is the way they did the schedule. They, you know, they, the pro races were timed and they would stop the amateurs, but the pro am guys would race right before the pros. And so it was like, we're part of the big show. Yep. I think was a, a lot of it. You're exactly yeah, I right. I remember. Go ahead. Um, 2008 Thomas Brown when he won pro-am class had factory support Mm -hmm. from Yamaha and you know, it was him and then Pat Brown was the pro rider. So that kind of like made it legit, like pro-am, you know, it's gotta be legit. If if somebody's getting factory support, that's running this class. Exactly. And I feel like in the years that followed that the series glorified it enough. And then that's why they ended up taking the second pro-am class away and they just put it in the schedule and all those things because they wanted to force some of us to move up, you know? Um, so yeah. I got to run pro-am the two pro-ams for a year or two, and then they took them away and just made it one. Um, but I thought the coolest years of pro-am were that kind of era there that, you know, 2000, you know, eight, nine, 10, and a couple of years that followed that. Um, and the racing was just so good in those classes back then. Yeah, for sure. There was crazy battles. And like you said, everybody wanted to watch pro am. Mm-hmm. It was just exciting. To me, it was just as exciting as the pro races. Well, and as a, and as a fan, as I, like I said earlier, as a rider, a little bit younger than you, that's exactly how I thought of it. I wanted to watch pro am just as much as, as I wanted to watch the pro class. You know, I looked at you guys like pros, like that's how the pro am class was. It was, that's how it was viewed back then. So, um, so yeah, Joel, Joel won the, the pro am unlimited division that year, but you edged him out in pro am production, um, kind of debunking Casey Greek's comments from a few episodes ago. So, uh, the battles between you and Joel, um, were crazy that summer. And, and if you want to tie up anything there and, and pro am before we move on i'll let you do that now yeah for sure um it it came down close i think 
I mean, honestly, it, I know Joel had some mechanicals. I had, I don't think I really had, I think I went all year with no mechanicals. That was one thing I was always like, Darren was super, super on top of everything. Sure. I mean, I can remember, I, I want to say I had a new, new top end every race that year. Okay. Um, and just like, he was like, he's very, very meticulous on everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that was part of a big part of my success that year. Um, and then with Joel, I, one thing I wanted to add was, um, I mean, we were fierce competitors. I, I respected him. I mean, he, there were certain tracks that like everybody knows Unadilla is that's his track. Like he's going to win there <laughs> typically unless something happens. Right. Um, but there were certain races where I knew like I was going to have to do everything to beat him. And then there were certain tracks where I'm like, this is more my style track. Um, but I'll never forget. I wanted to bring it up. Red bud 2010. Um, there's a, there was some controversy. A lot of people that like, I feel like I gained some fans there. And I also gained some not fans, people that were closer with him. Uh, but it, it was a pro-am race. And I can remember it was coming down to the end and I was losing steam and he was gaining steam. Like he was catching me. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was, I, the whole last lap, he was breathing up and like he was right there. I could feel him. Okay. Um, but I was riding defensive, like never even touched him, never sent him off the track, but I was blocking his lines. You know, if I'd come in low in a corner. I'd drift high. You know, I never cross jumped him or anything. The, the one corner though, where I did kind of jump over was after Loraco's leap, that left-hander, I, I was on the outside. And so he started to dive the inside and I cut inside. Okay. He went outside and I remember I was so relieved because it was like, there's another lap. I probably wasn't going to hold on because he was just, he was on it. And I remember his mom and dad were so mad at me. And I mean, it was like, they were yelling at me and I'm like, what? And they were basically saying, you know, you're blocking him, cutting him off. And I can remember I, and I was hot, you know, from the race and worn out. Sure. I said, what do you want me to do? Pull over and let him win. We're racing here for a win. But anyways, that was, and I feel like, um, that was the worst it ever got between us. And I feel like he never lost respect for me. I never lost respect for him. And each time we knew it was like, we're the top guys and we're going to go out and put on a show and lay it all on the track. Yeah. So, so I, I, I really enjoyed racing him. Yeah. I remember, awesome. I remember that race at Red Bud that year. Um, and I, you're exactly, I couldn't remember exactly the details. Like obviously you could, but I remember it being, remember being like the best race of the year, you know, between you two, the gnarliest race of the year. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know what, it's, it's the coolest thing when you can race somebody because so often, um, even if there's a rivalry, you end up having a connection to that person because you respect them because you know what they're putting in to compete with you. Cause you know what you're putting in. So then you respect this person cause you know, they're doing the work, you know, that, um, you know, that they're going through the same thing you are. So you have this weird connection in a way. And, um, it's, it's always fun to race somebody that you respect and, you know, um, you can battle them hard and they're not going to do anything crazy to you or anything like that. That's, that's the, that's uh, something, uh, a weird like unspoken um kind of cool relationship that happens between you know two uh you know gnarly maybe rivals isn't the word but two competitors like that it's it's kind of cool and, and it's something we don't speak about and uh very often i feel like we'll get right back to the show but now a word from our sponsors and thank you for listening to these ads without these great companies none of this would be possible show your support for the people who support us Welcome to the team, two-time champ Joel Hetrick, who dropped the biggest news of the offseason when he announced his move to CST Tires. The CST takeover has been gaining momentum over the past several seasons, and now Joel Hetrick and his Phoenix Racing teammate Jeffrey Rastrelli are the most recent additions. The Pulse MXR tire has helped lead riders like Thomas Brown to race wins in three consecutive Quad Cross of Nations titles, Nick Janusa to the Pro Class podium, myself Cody Jansen as I rode my Pulse MXR fronts and white label soft comp on rears, to back-to-back -back national championships in the Junior 25 Plus class, and the most recent additions have us thinking a Pro Class national championship is on the horizon for CST tires. The Pulse MXR tire, available in soft and standard compounds, offers the highest level of traction, 
most predictable cornering, and superior wear characteristics when compared to the competition. Visit shop.csttires.com to join the CST Takeover today or prepare to be beat by someone who did. Joel Hatcherick, Jeffrey Rastrelli, Nick Janusa, myself, and so many others are believers in CST Tires. Are you? CST Tires, where passion meets the ground. You already know we're Team Blue Crew here at the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. Whether it's second all-time winningest, seven-time and reigning ATV MX Pro Class National Champion Chad Wienan, or six-time and current XC1 Pro ATV GNCC National Champion Walker Fowler, it's clear the podium-proven Yamaha YFC 450R is the winning choice of sport ATVs. This unprecedented success for the YFC 450R, its unrivaled quality and performance, and the undeniable fact that Yamaha is the leading OEM supporter of ATV racing has created a Yamaha takeover within the sport quad market. Better yet, Yamaha's Blue Crew Racer Support Program is back and even stronger for 2021, meaning Yamaha riders are about to cash in on higher payouts and more prize opportunities, including a chance to win a brand new YFZ 450R. For more info, head over to YamahaBlueCrew.com, follow them on social media at Yamaha Outdoors, and check out Yamaha's full proven off-road lineup at YamahaOutdoors.com today. For over 150 years, Valvoline has led the charge by being dedicated to constant improvement and innovation across all disciplines of racing. Valvoline has sponsored some of the greatest names in motorsports, and for the better part of a decade, I've been fortunate enough to be part of the historically great Team Valvoline. From my commuting vehicles to small engines, race quads, and everything in between, I trust nothing but Valvoline in all of my equipment. I've experienced increased function and durability as well as a longer life expectancy thanks to Valvoline's array of products and lubricants. Since 1866, Valvoline has been focused on bettering your experience, whether on road, on track, and everywhere in between. Upgrade to Valvoline today and check them out at Valvoline.com. SSI Decals is a name synonymous with ATV racing, synonymous with big time success, and absolutely synonymous with the best looking decals around. An offshoot of their parent company that was established in 1947, SSI first took shape from owner Ian Harris's passion for ATVs. With what started as just making numbers and decals for riders like Chad Wienan, the company quickly took off, and today you couldn't imagine ATV motocross without SSI decals. The graphics maker and designer now supports all the top teams in ATV motocross, as well as teams and riders racing GNCC, Work Series, Pro Motocross and Supercross, Canadian Pro Motocross, Short Course Off-Road Trucks, UTVs, Snowcross, and, oh yeah, six-time NHRA World Champion Clay Milliken. No project is too big or too small for SSI decals, making your identity stick with championship level graphics. Head over to SSIDecals.com today and then maybe call the doctor because things are about to get sick. The Digging Deep ATV MX podcast is brought to you in part by DID in their range of championship winning chains. Powered by technology, DID chains are designed to give you the greatest strength to weight ratio, making them the optimal chain for racing and giving you a championship level edge. DID has been driving championship winning race programs since 1933, chosen by champions such as Chad Wienan, Joel Hetrick, and myself, Cody Jansen. Champion above the rest is DID's 520ATV2 chain, with those same design principles and materials being used throughout their entire line of products, including their on-road category as well. Pick up a DID chain today at your local dealer or reputable online e-tailer. DID what drives you. We are proud to be partnered with Numira Technologies. Since 2001, Numira has led the charge in the ATV and side-by-side market, covering more applications than anyone else in the industry. Numira's advanced piston technology uses a NASA-exclusive aluminum alloy that helps to reduce expansion rates, that allows for tighter tolerances, and leads to higher overall engine performance for your machine. For more information about Numira's wide offerings of pistons, rings, gaskets, and industry-leading top-end repair kits, Visit your local dealer or online at www.numira.com. Numira Technologies, pistons with an attitude. We are pleased to be partnered with Bronco ATV and UTV Components. Bronco has been an industry leader in replacement hard parts and accessories for all makes and models for over 15 years. With a catalog that includes a full line of electrical components, engine internals like rods and cylinders, all the way down to suspension parts and bearing kits. Bronco is your hard part source for whatever you need for whatever you ride. Available exclusively through distributors around the world. Visit your local dealer or online at broncoatv.com. 
4Works Carbon's innovative lightweight products include top-notch seat covers, carbon fiber, and plastic hoods, gas tank covers, exhaust shields, shock guards, and much more. Whether you have an ATV, UTV, or snowmobile, 4Works has the goodies that will improve your ride and make you salivate. We trust 4Works for increased function and a sexier look, and you should too. 4Works Carbon, always working hard to bring high quality and innovative parts to the market. Check them out today at fwcarbon.com. As the number one podcast in ATV racing, it's only right that we partner with the industry leaders in suspension tuning. Insert Impact Solutions. Impact Solutions is a full-service ATV and side-by-side suspension center specializing in the revalving and service of your motocross and off-road suspension. With over 25 years of elite-level knowledge, experience, and testing with riders of all ages and ability levels, Casey Greek, Jay Goble, and the Impact crew strive to exceed the client's expectations for service and setup. Impact Solutions is the official Elka Suspension Service Center of the United States, offering unmatched product knowledge and experience. Whether you're in need of service, parts, warranty, sales, or technical support, Impact Solutions has you covered. Head over to ImpactSolutionsATV.com or give them a call today. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. The following message is brought to you by Manscaped.com. The Manscaped engineering team has outdone themselves this time, creating the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, now available for purchase in the U.S. and Canada. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, an official sponsor of the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast, with this exclusive offer of 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0 and I am blown away. This thing is next level. What sets this trimmer apart from all the rest? The Lawnmower 4.0 gives you the ability to turn the LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. It features a new multi-functioning on-off switch with travel lock for those of us who like to travel. And my favorite, the new trimmer allows you to customize your trim with four different guard lengths and upgrade from its predecessor that only featured two. If you're listening, you know that good tools are a must, so wait no more to get the best tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com by using code DIGGINGDEEP20. The Digging Deep ATV MX podcast is also sponsored by DP Brakes, a longtime supporter of ATV racing and the world leader in centered brake technology. DP has been dominating the ATV world for decades, supporting the best four-wheeled racers on the planet. 2021's impressive lineup includes Joel Hetrick and Jeffrey Rastrelli of the Phoenix Racing Team, myself, Cody Jansen, and my back-to-back national championships, Baldwin Motorsports, Ford Brothers Racing, Nick Janusa, Wesley Wolf, and many more, including all of the top 14 GNCC Series pros, led by the champ Walker Fowler, Bryson Neal, Cole Richardson, Jared McClure, and Chris Borich. These top riders continue to appreciate the high performance and impressive durability that their DP brakes have to offer, products that ultimately help place them on the top of the podium. Available at www.dp-brakes.com, purchase at your local dealer, or message the show for their contact info today. What are you waiting for? Join the best ATV riders in the world on DP brakes. 15 years into the brand's existence, Factory 43 is back with us and continuing to make huge waves in the ATV world. For the second consecutive season, Factory 43 is the official aluminum parts choice of the Phoenix Racing ATV team providing their state-of-the-art Evo Nerf bars, MX-style front bumpers, and grab bars for some of the fastest riders on the planet. If you're in the market to upgrade your Nerf bars, bumpers, or grab bars, head over to factory43atv.com to see their full line of products available for all makes and models. Want to be just like Joel Hetrick and Jeffrey Rastrelli riding with Factory 43's industry-leading products? Head over to factory43atv.com today. Bikes, Trikes, and Quads LLC has been supplying riders with aftermarket components from the industry's top brands for over a decade. With over 80,000 products in stock for your ATVs, UTVs, metric and HD motorcycles, dirt bikes, and snowmobiles, Bikes, Trikes, and Quads LLC can tend to all your power sports needs, from hard parts to riding gear. Bikes, Trikes, and Quads also offers hard-to-find used parts for your vintage dirt bike, ATV, three-wheeler, or snowmobile. Use discount code ATVMX at www.btqllc.com for 10% off of orders of $100 or more. 
We're grateful to have Bikes, Trikes, and Quads LLC digging deep with us. Thank you, BTQ LLC. We are proud to be partnered with Gripped Gloves. Gripped is an ATV rider owned and operated brand with a rider in mind and the goal of keeping costs affordable. The Michigan based family operation recognizes riders' desire to showcase their identity. Owner David Payne's love for eccentric colorways and crazy patterns shows in his product something not often found in the work of big manufacturers. Here to push stereotypes and limitations, Grip's drive is to produce a glove with cool colors and designs that won't break the bank. With comfort and quality as key motivators, the Family Affair is constantly working on the next more innovative and improved glove. Get a grip on life, join the Gripped movement, because no one wants a bland glove. Check them out today at grippedgloves.com, that's G-R-I-P-T gloves.com, and use discount code DIGGINGDEEP10 to save at checkout. Just like the sport of ATV motocross as a whole, our Digging Deep community is brought together by the love for racing that we all share. Our sport is compiled of many great people, and leading that charge is the Launderville family at Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. This racing-owned family business is a steel and concrete supplier serving the entire United States. Launderville Steel is a full-service steel supplier of new and surplus steel, aluminum, and stainless steel products headlined by the 4130 chromoly tubing and plate used in the building of chassis for ATVs and UTVs, off-road truck racing, late model dirt and pro tractor pulling series, drag racing, and more. Launderville Steel loves their racing just as much as we do, but don't forget about their concrete division as well. With over 25 years of experience, the concrete division can supply everything you need to complete your next business or personal project. Their central Midwest location enables LSE to easily serve customers across the United States. For a quote, additional info, answers to more of your questions, or to talk a little racing, head over to LaundervilleSteel.com or give them a call today. We are proud to be partnered with yet another racer-owned company. Thank you, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply. Thanks for listening, and remember to support our partners. Now back to the show. We can kind of move into the pro class now. The next year, sure. I feel like we were, we were both rookies, and we were going in, you know, to, or I can speak for myself. Uh, I don't know, really know how he felt, but I assume similar. Um, you know, we knew we were going to be competitive, um, but I feel like I still was, like, competing against him. Like, I wanted to be the best rookie. I wanted the rookie of the year. Of course. Award. Everybody does. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that, so that's what I was going to say before is the battles weren't over. So it was like, it's not like, uh, it's not like there was the pro-am chapter of you guys. And then the pro chapter, that's how it felt. It just kind of bled right over into the pro class that next year, you guys both went pro at the same time. And then ultimately lock yourselves in a gnarly battle for that rookie of the year spot. Um, and, and if I remember correctly though, didn't you almost not race that year in 2011? Yeah. And I honestly, sometimes I forget about that. Um, I was, I, like I said earlier in the off season, I would start riding dirt bikes and um, each year I'd get a little more serious with the dirt bikes and started like getting really competitive and wanting to like actually go race. And I actually did. I went to many O's um, and raced, Oh man, I can't remember what year that was. I think 2010, 09 or 10, one of the two. Okay. And um, won a couple motos and had a championship on the line and I crashed my brains out. Oh, but shoot. At that point, um, we kind of had a little sit down with Darren and my, my dad and um, kind of was like, do we want to keep doing this or do you want to race dirt bikes? And I was kind of like, like all my friends, you know, trying to go to Loretta's. And to me, I was like, that would be cool. It was just a new, I had a new fire basically under me. And sure. so we talked about it and basically we were, we had made the decision that we were about to go buy a couple brand new 250 Fs and, you know, send the suspension off and like just do it full, full time. Okay. And then we get a call from, from Jimmy O'Dell at Can-Am and he offered me a deal and so then we're like oh wait a second and uh so then uh, we're like well shoot we can this would be a, a good deal and so then it just like completely changed it was like dirt bikes were out the window we didn't even buy them mm-hmm. i was you know as soon as as soon as i got the can ams we stripped them down got me a practice bike built and i was back back full 
and, and it's almost like I just forgot about it because it, it, it just went back into race mode and yeah. What you knew uh, already. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's kind of, kind of weird that that happened and uh, crazy that I forget about it. But. but, but it's, it, I mean, I'm glad that you were able to do, I'm glad that things went the way that it went because that, that rookie season of yours was, um, was special. So, um, as we get into that rookie season of yours as a pro, um, I do want to ask you though, before we do, uh, I want to ask you what your mindset was back then, because jumping into the pro class with dudes, you've kind of always looked up to, um, is no joke, especially mentally. Like that's the biggest thing I feel like when, and you're still young at that time. I mean, I don't know what you would have been, but I mean, 18, 19, 20, something like that when you're going, I think pro. I was 19. Yeah. yeah. So, I think I was 19. I so when it. you're, when you're lining up and at that time, there's legends of the sport that you're lining up with still, uh, the Natalies and the birds and guys like that. So, um, I feel like that's a really big mental hurdle. And that's something that I wanted to touch on. Like, what was your mentality then? Um, honestly, I felt like I placed myself as a fourth or fifth place guy. That was my expectations. Okay. And the reasoning is I raced a lot with Thomas Brown and, and Cody Miller. So at that point, um, you know, we would do local races in Texas and off season we'd ride together. Me and Thomas actually became really good friends. Um, a lot of people didn't know, but he would, he'd drive his rig up to my house and stay with me for a week or so. We'd go ride. We'd, you know, we would go screw off, have fun in okay. the off season. Um, sure. then I'd go down to his house and, um, and then we started like, you know, staying at Jeremiah's together. And, and then he's, he actually introduced me and Chad, but going back to my expectations, uh, I raced with him enough to know that I was very close to him. Sure. Um, a lot of times I'd beat him at, down in Texas, but two, he would, he would be on his practice bike and I'd be on a, a Suzuki race bike. Sure. So it was kind of like a little unfair. <laughs> okay. Um, but it was like, if I'm racing Cody Miller and Thomas Brown, Darren's like, we're, we're running the race bike. Um, mm -hmm. and that was when I was a pro am guy and he, they were pro. Sure. So you had cool. that it felt, you had that good that I could beat them. Um, yeah. But I knew like on race day when Thomas is on his race bike and I'm on mine, then yeah, there was about a second a lap difference. Okay. I just was going to say that um, you had that measuring stick. So you kind of had an idea of where you fit. Um, and that changes your mentality right away. Um, and, and I guess the only reason why I wanted to touch on that is, you know, for me, and I was never, I wasn't, you know, quite at, you know, the level where you were there in your rookie season. But, um, I think that that was my biggest downfall. I was too much of a fan of these guys when I was racing them in the pro class. So if Uppy or Creamer or Natalie or Bird or whatever, if you're around one of those riders, I think, I probably didn't race them hard, uh, as hard as I should have, because they were still my heroes, you know, um, with you and I didn't, I mean, coming from Wisconsin, like you don't have guys to ride, but I had to noble, you know, and that was great. Um, but I didn't have any of those other fast guys to ride with. So for you to have that measuring stick and to be able to change your expectations, to have high expectations, well, you're not going to give those guys any, any extra room. And I feel like that was kind of your mentality from the start. Like you were just kind of a dog. Like, I feel like you were a, like you were just, you know, you were a headstrong guy to begin with. And that was probably your advantage right off the bat in the pro class. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, I mean, I've seen comments and stuff. A okay. lot of people had noticed that. And, and I, that's true. I mean, I, I was not scared of anybody on the track. You know, I, I ended up having, you know, people that, you know, got mad at me and because of the way I raced and, okay. and, uh, I've, I always felt like, like we're racing for money. You know, it wasn't a lot of money, but it's, we got a lot on the line and I'm not going to give you anything. Just like I said earlier, I was not going to just let Joel pass me. I right. didn't do anything possible, you know, short of crashing him. Um, definitely not going to do that, but I, it didn't matter. And it, it showed that year it didn't matter if it was John Natale or Joe bird, the two guys, you know, that, and this is, I mean, I think a lot of people know this, but Thomas Brown had issues with Natale and bird mentally. If they were behind him, it, he was shook basically. Mm -hmm. And, and then that's easy for them to, to get by him. And I, 
I basically made myself do the opposite. Like they're, they're just another guy out there. Um, and ultimately never had any issues with bird. You know, everybody, you, you hear a lot of things. Um, but me and Natalie had a run in, I figured it'd be worth bringing up. Okay. Well, everybody <laughs> likes a little drama. Right. Um, at Unadilla, he, uh, he came in and did the normal Natalie pass. Like, I mean, it was wheel to wheel, but slam, like my hands, hands came off the bars. He slammed me so hard in this corner. Okay. And in my head, I said, no way I'm getting him back in this next corner. So I come in and do the same thing and pass him. Well, then I, I messed up and it was that short little step up that would take you on the straightaway where the mechanics area is. Yep. Yep. So I messed up and he passes, he basically lands better passes me down the straight and he goes by flipping me off. And so I just had a fire under me because <laughs> okay. I'm like, that, I mean, I did to you what you did to me. Um, you know, most people will just let you do it and then you're gone. Nobody makes so, me bleed my own blood. <laughs> exactly. I may be a rookie, but I'm not just going to lay over, you know? So anyways, needless to say, he pulled away and, and left me. Uh, I didn't quite have the pace that he had. Okay. Um, but to me, uh, I was like, that's, I'm going to leave it all out on the track. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, didn't like it, but, uh, that, that was me. And I think that's kind of what people remember and, and yeah. know me by. Well, I, I, and the reason why I mostly wanted to bring that up was so that, you know, some of these younger riders or riders that are maybe getting ready to go pro or whatever could kind of learn that from you. Because again, I wish I could go back in time and kind of learn that myself, you know, go back in time to my professional career and, and learn that because I often thought if you could take somebody who, you know, loves the sport, but maybe didn't know the history of the support, the sport or have, you know, put all these guys up on pedestals. That was my mistake. You know, that was my mistake was that I, I still idolize these guys. Um, but right away you showed that you belonged because in your third professional race, you finished in the top five and by mid season as a rookie, you were on the podium. Uh, what was that day like at steel city? That was where you got your first podium. Uh, what do you remember about that day? Because that, that had to be, that had to be special. Uh, first of all, the first memory of that day was Chad Weenan getting pissed off at me in qualifying. <laughs> okay. Um, like I said, I, I honestly, I pissed some people <laughs> off, but me and Chad were actually pretty close. Uh, I stayed at his house a lot you know, Thomas introduced us and Chad was awesome and took us in and we would get to ride at his place, which, I mean, I know you've been there, but not a lot of people can say they got to stay there and ride there with no, him. That's prestigious. And yeah. so I learned a lot of things. Um, and it, it was awesome. So me and him had a, a good relationship and, you know, he was a, above my level, but I would study him and try to do things that he did. And we're also similar, you know, body, you know, size, like similar body type. Yeah. Right. I'm a bigger guy, heavier yep. guy. And, and so I would try to mimic what he does, but I can remember in qualifying, um, I was on a fast lap and, and he comes up behind me and uh, I know he was too, cause he obviously is catching me, but it was, it was right. my fast lap. And so I'm like, I'm not pulling out of his way. Cause this is, uh, this is my fast lap. Well, he got mad because you know, obviously I probably, you know, messed him up or whatever, but I you can held, remember I was just like, held him up I held him bit. off. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, so I just kind of got a little confidence and I'm like, he's, you know, he's ruffled his feathers over me. I'm a rookie and he's the top guy. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I don't know, it just kind of gave me some confidence. Okay. And, um, I don't know, really. I, the rest of the day was kind of a blur. I think, I think it was first moto that I ended up second. Yep. Um, second oh, the first I do moment. remember. So I, I came out second behind Upperman and that there's a double, double, double through the corner on yep. the very top of the hill. On the top, yep. Turning. Yep. Yeah. And Upperman messed up on the last one and he crashed and I almost ran him over, but I didn't, I barely dodged him. I'm in the lead and I, I, it was a weird feeling. I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> and, uh, okay. I'm not sure who ended up, I think it was bird that ended up I think so. beating me. I think so. Yeah. And, uh, and then I think I had a bad second moto, but yeah, two, in, two, seven, two, seven for third overall. That doesn't happen super often. Right. 
But, and I uh, think Thomas Brown was on the podium with yep. me that day. Yep, Joel. Which was cool. Like for Joel. us, we were buddies, and it was it was awesome. Yeah, Joel won that day, and Thomas was the other guy on the podium. So that was uh, that had to be pretty cool. I knew that there was the Thomas Brown connection there between you two, so I figured that was one of the things I had in my notes that that had to be cool for you to get your first one, and then have Thomas there for it too. Another thing I wanted to mention because I do remember this. It was a pretty hot day, and I, I'm pretty sure I gassed out really bad that second moto. Okay. Um, which was kind of, to be honest, uh, a downfall of mine. Um, I wasn't completely in shape. I mean, Thomas and Chad and all them guys were dedicated to training and working out. And to me, no, I, w- I never liked working out, hated running. I would try to just ride and pound motos and okay, it worked for most of my career. But I feel like that year, if I was in shape like Chad was, that I could have probably easily been in the top five and not, you know, I ended up sixth, but I feel like I could have been a little higher than I was. If you, if you look back, you'll even see it in my lap times that, you know, I'd fade at the end of the race. Oh, okay. Um, so I feel like that was that day. I, I can remember I did so good. The first moto and the second moto, I would, I just got tired and fell back really bad. Okay. Um, yeah, that's not that I don't, I don't remember it that way just because I remember you being such a, I don't know how else to say it other than like I did before that you were a dog. So you were, um, I mean, you were aggressive, but you were, like you said, not somebody that was just going to give the spot to somebody not going to, you know, if you had to force the issue on a pass, that's what you would do. Like, that's just how I remember you. So, um, I didn't remember the fading part, but then just, uh, so just two events later, then you won the opening moto at Sunday Creek in Ohio as a rookie, you won a pro moto. And for the record, Joel Hetrick hadn't even done that yet. Um, so, so you got that up on him. What do you remember about that day at that Sunday Creek? Cause now you won a moto. So now at this point, you must've known what to do when you got into the lead. Yeah. And ironically enough, um, I took the lead from, um, Upperman at that race as well. He yep. messed up in a corner. I passed him. All I remember, it was an uphill start and I could not believe I came out second in the first corner. Um, it's, it's no, um, secret that I was a little underpowered that year, um, power wise. And so I struggled with starts. I was normally a sixth, seventh place. You know, if I had a good start, that's where I'd be. Sure. And I remember coming out second and I'm just like blown away. Yep. And then he instantly messed up. I take the lead. And I remember just pounding laps and it was, a uh, it was muddy. I, I think it had rained. Um, and so it was just like, you know, one of those where there's a good groove and you just got to focus on staying in that groove and not getting out of it. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I just rode smart, stayed in that groove. There were some jumps, I think, that I wasn't even jumping because they were sketchy. Okay. Um, you know, if you're trying to jump it in the mud. Yeah. And it was one of those races where I felt so slow, but it was, I was just being smooth and consistent and it worked out. And it's funny you say that because I do remember it being like, uh, like wet slick, even like watching it on the videos and stuff. Um, so you won that first moto, uh, obviously that was monumental for you fourth in the second moto second overall in the day. Um, what else do you remember? Because that was, that was overall, I guess on paper, it was the best performance of your professional career. So what, what else do you remember about that? Uh, yeah, I remember kind of being a, like, I was excited, but I was a little upset on the, with my second moto. Okay. Because after winning, I, I basically, I'm like, if I go podium, there's a good chance I can get first overall. Like how crazy would that be? Yeah. And so I had high intentions of going out and podium at least, but really try to win again. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work out, but still fourth was one of my better finishes of the year. And, um, uh, so I was still, I was happy with it. And I felt like it, it was just, I kept building that momentum and that was the, ne- the next step that I needed. Mm-hmm, exactly. So, um, so I don't know if you have any other memories that really stand out about that season and at the conclusion of 2011. Uh, so you had five top fives, two podiums in that moto win that we just talked about, but those who remember that season and how it concluded know that, um, there should have been more because coming into the finale, you had 
already surpassed your expectations. I feel like for your rookie season, you came into Loretta's in position to claim rookie of the year and in, in, in top five in points, like, um, like you were on record saying was your goal. So pick up there. Tell me about, unless you want to touch on anything previous to Loretta's, um, tell me the story of, of Moto one at Loretta's because that that's why I said on paper, Sunday Creek might've been, you know, the highlight of your career. But when I think of the highlight of your pro career, I think of that day at Loretta's, even though it might've not been it on paper. Yeah. So I'm going to rewind just a little bit. So, yeah, you know, I was talking about how I wasn't fully in shape. Well, okay. It was probably halfway through the season or maybe a little earlier. Um, we kind of had a little sit down. Like we all were like, Hey, we, we got to do something different. You're, you're having issues, second motos, like it's obvious you're not a hundred percent in shape. Okay. And, uh, so I ended up getting a trainer. I did CrossFit, but it was a, like a one-on-one -on -one. It was just me and him and he would focus on, you know, certain things. And, okay. And I started making strides, but it was, it was a little too late. You know, most people are doing that in the off season sure. where I was trying to do it mid season in between races. Um, but I felt like coming towards the end of the season, I started getting stronger and, and doing better. Uh, but right before Loretta's, I was racing a TQRA race, and I actually did the full season that year. So we we came home after the, each national and tried to to do the TQRAs, and a lot of it was because uh, K and M had a really good contingency program. Oh yeah, yes, yep. and that was when the Hunter and Cody Miller. That's all they raced was that series because okay. they had a good deal. You know, it paid out well. Mm -hmm. So I would come home, but I'd race them, and so it gave me good practice. You know two yeah. good guys to race against Yep, and, you know, put a little money in my pocket and, you know, helped me get through the season and stuff. So I had a, a, a bad, just basically a bad judgment on a, um, a track in Texas and I ended up breaking my foot and oh. I did, I basically just ignored it and limped it and okay. didn't really ride before Loretta's. Now and, that you say that, I remember that video of you with your, with your foot in the Creek. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So it was very swollen. I can barely get it in my boot. Okay. And so in between motos, I went down the creek and stuck my foot in the in the water. Instead of icing it, I just sat okay. there. You know, that water's yep. ice cold. I remember so this now. The Loretta's. Yeah, I remember this now from the ATV twenty four seven or wherever they called it back then. Mm -hmm. okay. So I was a little. You know, I went from probably being in the best shape of the season to breaking my foot and just trying to tough through it. So I didn't get to practice or work out or anything for those three weeks prior to Loretta's. Sure. Um, and then I come out and I remember leading the race um, and Joel was behind me. I mean, he was all over me. Joel was on, on, on fire that weekend, but I can remember holding him off. Then he passed me. I don't, it was shortly either he passed me or right before he passed me. I don't know, but my chain came off. And then there's pictures on ATV riders of, of me pulling on the grab bar, put rolling the chain back on. Yeah. And, uh, it, it cost me a lot of spots. I think I got 10th or something like that. Um, and Joel went on to win. Mm -hmm. I think did Joel win both motos. He did. he did. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. So in that moto there, uh, you and Joel, you come out, you're locked in the snarly battle. Um, I actually rewatched that moto today. Um, shortly before we, we hopped on here and you led a majority of that race. Um, you kind of were guys were passing back and forth and then disaster strikes, your chain falls off. Joel goes on to win that moto gets max points. He goes one, one. And if that doesn't happen, you probably finish top five and, and earn rookie of the year honors. Um, if anything happens other than your chain falling off. Um, so, um, he ends up, he ends up beating you by, you know, four points. That's, that's all it came down to. Yep. Yeah. It was, I had a bad race and he had the best perfect, race he could possibly perfect, have. Perfect race. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the second moto I rode really well, had good battles with, um, Lawson mm -hmm. and rode well, but Joel just straight up, you know, smoked us. Um, so it was just, it was really a heartbreaker. Cause I, I was like, I had going into that race. I was like, even though I'm injured, just go out there and be consistent. And I got it. Mm -hmm. And the chain coming off was crazy because once we put it back on, like we're, when I come off track, we're trying to figure out why it happened. And my chain wasn't even loose. And so I'm like, how it, it must've got a piece of mulch or something, you know, ran through the sprocket and derailed it. Yep. 
um, because we didn't, the chain was not even loose at all when it came off the track. It was just a fluke deal. Um, well, you so know, that wasn't, you know, um, you know, eight years later or whatever, when it happened to Joel down there and his chain fell off, I think that there was a lot of people thinking the same thing that it must've been mulch or something like that, that derailed it. So, um, it's, it's funny how you both ended up having that happen just, uh, all those years apart. But like you said, you had a really good second moto cause you, you salvaged seventh overall in the day, which was incredible actually. But, uh, like, like you said, Joel's one, one finish earned him you know, max points, he gets you by four measly points there. And, and all that being said, I remember thinking that, you know, Chase Snap is going to contend in, you know, the years to follow, um, you know, it may be Joel and Chase battling for these titles, but as quickly as, as, um, well, uh, okay. Uh, so I'll, I won't get ahead of myself. If you have anything else you want to say about that weekend and how everything ended there. Um, but, Crazy! It, it was crazy to hear about how bad, you know, your, your foot was injured because it still looked like, like that was you in your best form. Like that was your best race of the year. That was the best you looked on the bike. That was the best. I mean, you were battling right at the front to win that thing. So um, anything else you want to tie up there before we move on? Um, I think it was just, I was just being mentally strong and trying to go out, you know, on top and and also too was to try to get a ride for the next year right yeah um you know everybody knows that's when you know each year there was a, a couple teams less than there was the year before and mm -hmm. so you know spots are limited yep. and so i was trying to really make a name for myself and show that i deserved a ride for the next year because we had help from from can am but i wasn't on the can am factory team um you know we were still running our our own rig you know we had we were paying for myself to race. Right. And, uh, and my dad actually, you know, basically said, um, you know, this, this is it. Like you're, you're going to have to find a ride or we're not, we're not going to be able to do this again next year. It's just getting too expensive at that level. Mm -hmm. And you know how that is. Um, so, yep. so at Loretta's, you know, we kind of had some conversations with people and trying to feel out things. And I got one offer, um, but it just wasn't really enough for me to, I, I don't know. It's, it's a hard question to answer because it, it was a long time ago. I don't remember all my emotions at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it came down to just, I wasn't, um, wasn't sure it was the right move for me. Like with our family business, my dad and, you know, my brother was working for my dad full time and, trying to prep for when my dad retires to take over the business. And I felt like if I waited too long. I'd miss that opportunity. And then oh, what do sure. I do? Yep. You know? So I kind of chose to retire and start learning the business is, is really the main reason why I didn't come back. Okay. Um, but if, but if I had a deal where, you know, it's a free ride and, you know, making a little bit of money, I probably would have, um, but that just, it didn't really pan out. I feel like, so yeah, I feel like, and, and obviously that was, I mean, credit to you for making a tough, but probably the correct decision there. Um, but I feel like there's so many people that, that, you know, would have loved to see you, you know, throw your name in the hat for one more year there, especially the way that you were starting to figure things out the way you were, but uh, that's what I was going to say before Then I didn't want to jump the gun, but as quickly as you came into professional ATV racing, uh, you were gone. That was the end of your, your ATV national career there one amazing season and you walked away and i remember thinking um because that's when things got really dire it went from you know three four years earlier that everybody and their brother had a factory ride to where there was really none left and i remember thinking man this guy at loretta's was you know either going to win, you know, that moto, or he was going to be right there in second. He won a moto early, earlier in the year. He was on the podium as a rookie, all those things. And that obviously wasn't commonplace seeing a rookie do so well. So it was, I just remember thinking for the sake of the sport, it was terrible to see you, uh, you know, not, not continue, not make it at least one more year just felt like, uh, ATV racing was missing out on a great talent. That's what it felt like from a fan perspective, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I've gotten a lot of, you know, messages and comments on social media, everybody asking me yeah. why and 
you know, making those comments and, but they say cool why it, it, they say why, but they know why, you know, I mean, you made yeah. a real world decision and, and I mean, nobody can get down on you for that. It's more as a right. fan, they, they wish that they could see you out there. That's what it comes down. Yeah. To. And I'm not the only one that's done that. There's a, a oh, lot of people who've done that, yeah. but yeah. I think the thing was, is, is as good of, I, as good as I did my rookie year and then not coming back, mm-hmm. a lot of people are like, why wouldn't you, when you, could have done even better the next year. Mm-hmm. And maybe selfishly, maybe selfishly because, because we would have loved to see you up in the mix. You know, it's no, mm-hmm. it's just because you had done that well, you know? Yep. Yeah. And I would have liked to, I mean, sometimes I look back and I'm like, man, to see Joel, what he's done now. And to know that I, how many times I've beat him, not to say I would be beating him or whatever, you know, you can't sure. predict, but I'm like, sure. I know I could be, out there competing with him for wins and championships. And so, so that was going to be my very next question was if you ever, ever wonder what if Do you ever wonder, you know, what if, if, you know, because, um, you were racing Joel, obviously, you know, we just covered all that. You were racing Chad back then, and those are still the guys to beat to this day. So I just had, I really had wondered if your mind ever drifted to envisioning yourself battling at the front of the pro class for championships with these guys. And it is cool to, you know, to hear, that maybe that is a thought you have from time to time because it shows that um that you do still have a like a love for the sport you didn't walk away because you didn't love it it just there was other factors Mm -hmm. yeah no I definitely have and I I don't get too carried away I don't like I said I don't think I would be out there winning you know that you can't you can't predict that but I understand. Uh, I know I could be a podium guy or, or back then. I mean, now it's been 10 years, definitely <laughs> not now, but um, yeah, I think I could have, could have done well if I would have continued and continued growing that I had that momentum, you know, at the end of 2011. Yeah. And if I really carried that through the whole off season, I feel like I could have been a podium guy mm-hmm. kind of like Joel did, you know, that next year he came out, you know, yep. podium almost every time mm-hmm. if things, you know, didn't have any issues. Yeah. So you got, you, you mentioned having an offer there. Um, did, did you ever get close to making any kind of comeback or, uh, maybe I should ask, you know, how, how, how much did it hurt you to not be there in, in 2012? Was that a, was that an open wound? Yes and no. I mean, it was, I, I didn't really let it bother me too much because once we decided we weren't doing it, that was it. just like, you know, move on. And So then I just started new thing, you know, I started working, but then I bought a, a brand new dirt bike and like, I felt good that I was making a payment every month on my dirt bike. And, yeah. you know, I, I felt like an adult basically where, you know, <laughs> sure. Um, I never had that before. So I actually like kind of enjoyed going to work and, you know, getting a paycheck every week and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it kind of helped me. Uh, but I still followed everything, you know, um, had a lot of friends that, I, you know, Still this day that I always watch and root for. Um, Jeffrey Rustrelli is probably my um, my number one rider that's still out there. He was always just a good good guy and a com- very competitive racer. I remember I remember him racing you, um, you know Joel. Like back in the day, watching him, I always I always liked his style. So and I still talk to him every now and then. So it, and he cool. was. And we didn't mention it, but he was one of the guys battling, you know, he was in that, that class with you and Joel there in pro-am too. Right. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, you know, he would beat us a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, he, he was always right there. Yep. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned kind of getting into the real world stuff and, you know, joining the workforce and the, the family business and all those things. So, um, tell me then, because I preach this all the time. So what, uh, what life lessons did you learn by chasing your dream as an ATV racer? You were still so young back then, but I bet you learned a bunch of, uh, probably great things that you could kind of transition, um, to life after racing. So what, uh, you know, what uh, abilities, what, you know, what things did you learn while kind of living that racer life that, uh, what did you learn that could translate to kind of your real world life after that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think just like, like you get what you put in, like you, okay. you, 
you give a hundred percent, you're going to get great things. If you, you know, go out there and, and just don't give it your all, you're not going to get good things. Sure. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of a tough question. No, but, but you had kind of touched on it earlier in when we were kind of talking about that part of your, your, your pro season there that you almost wished you put in a little more work uh, at certain times and you ended up putting in a little more work and you saw the results on the racetrack. So that does make a lot of sense that, um, that that's something that you could kind of take, uh, take out of there. Yeah. You get out of it, what you put into it. And, um, I think it's different for everybody, but you do, I mean, those are memories that you'll never be able to, uh, I, I should say those are memories that you'll never lose. Those are memories that you'll probably, you know, hold on forever. Those are like the glory days or whatever of, you know, you were a professional athlete, that's stuff that you'll never forget. And like you said, I mean, there are things that you will have learned throughout that process that you're able to kind of hold on to and maybe reference even down the road, who knows with, with your kids or whatever, who knows? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so today you're and you mentioned it a few times, you're working at the family business, right? The pool industry. Um, and you have a podcast. We haven't touched on that yet. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I work at crystal pools. That's a family business. My dad started, uh, 27 years ago. And okay. so now me and my brother are helping run it, um, with plans to continue, you know, another generation. Sure. Um, and then yes, the podcast, uh, it's called pit racing. Um, we started this just me and two buddies, um, back in, I think January or February, it kind of was just kind of a joke from, from Austin. Um, he's kind of our media guy and okay. he, um, he started talking about like, we should do a podcast and we're like, oh, that's cool. And, and then I brought up yours and I was like, you know, I've never, I thought I wasn't a podcast guy. And when I was going to Loretta's a couple of years ago to go watch, um, I started listening to yours cause I had nine hours to drive and sure. I was like, man, this is really cool. And so when he said that, I was like, I'm all, I'm all in, let's yeah. do it. And yep. it was just going to be for fun, you know, n- no expectations. And, uh, me, him and, and Cole Supernall, which is one of our other good friends. And, um, and we ran with it and right off the bat, we had people just like loving it. And, and, uh, so we, we basically just cover, we mainly cover Oklahoma motocross Okay. And just the general dirt bike scene around here. Um, yep. cause the three of us, we race the Oklahoma state series. Um, and we race the vet class, the plus 25. Sure. We all race each other. And so we were, we've been shedding light on uh, local motocross. Okay. And so like the state series, people love it because we're bringing attention. We can, you know, we did a, a preseason show where we talked about, you know, different sure. tracks we're hitting and, just different topics, different riders to watch for and things like that. Um, so, and it's been great. We've been trying to uh, have a new guest each episode that uh, kind of sheds a different light and brings different followers to us, mm-hmm. um, which I'm sure you, you know how all that goes, Yeah, um, yeah but it, sure. it's worked out great. You know, each episode we have all kinds of new followers and people um, listening. So we're coming up on our 10th episode and, um, starting to gain traction, starting to get, you know, people messaging us interested in, and joining us, you know, as a, a partner and, you know, how, how they can, you know, rep their business or whatever. So we're learning as we go though. The, the one downfall is, is all three of us work a full-time job. Um, and then, you know, we also having kids and stuff. Um, it's hard to make time for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, no, I, but, I know, I know exactly how that goes because I feel like, uh, the, the, probably the, the people listening to this or the general public or whatever, you could, it's hard to fathom how much time and effort and work does go into it. You know, um, it's not, I mean, as much as you want it to feel like you're just sitting down with your buddies BSing, if you don't have, you know, kind of some outline or ideas or whatever, uh, I feel like it could, it could trail off real quick. I'm sure, I'm sure you feel the same way. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And we always have like select topics, yeah. bullet points. Um, but we've been friends, the three of us for so many years that it, we flow pretty good. I mean, okay. I know not to say we haven't got off track because <laughs> we do, 
but but, um, but that's kind of what people like sometimes too. You know, you you like like whether you're listening to pulp or something like that. You kind of like when they go off on a tangent. You know, right? And and people like drama and they like um, <laughs> you know not so serious all the time. Exactly. So yep. so we try to you know keep it light and mm-hmm. you know just have fun with it. That's really the 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 goal when we started and that's what we try to focus on. Yeah. You know what? And, and now that you said that, and I didn't think about it until now, but you, you might've messaged me sometime around that Loretta's trip. Cause I I'm pretty sure now that you say that, that you messaged me and said that you enjoyed what we were doing or whatever. And I remember thinking to myself that that meant a lot coming from you because you were somebody that I looked up to, you know, and obviously in, in the years previous to that. So that was, um, really cool. And, and yeah, I, so I was never a podcast guy. Like I didn't even, you'd, I'd read the word podcast. I didn't even know what podcast meant. You know, I didn't even know what that was and I didn't know where to get them. I didn't know whatever. And I remember like being in the race shop and, going on YouTube and like typing in racer X. And I was just going to listen to like whatever video was on there, you know, just so I could listen. Cause I wanted to listen to motocross stuff. And, uh, I stumbled across some kind of one of the podcasts or whatever and listened to that. And then I I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure there's like a podcast app on my phone or something. And it just snowballed from there. And then, um, I've been on record enough times saying, you know, how I, you know, we just started this podcast on a whim or whatever, but it's pretty cool to hear that, uh, you guys are doing very similar to what I'm doing here. Just trying to bring, you know, bring more coverage, bring more content, bring more stories to the ATV community. You're doing that for your own racing community there in, in, in Oklahoma. And that's pretty special. Like, um, as enthusiasts, as lovers of all things motocross, uh, that's what it's all about. So you're keeping it fun and you're, you're, you're bringing more coverage. You're also bringing, um, like you said, a little more personality and stuff to the sport that you enjoy. And when we were growing up, think about if, if, you know, you at 11 years old or whatever racing TQRA could have listened to something on your phone or whatever we were using back then iPods or whatever, uh, people talking about racing, we would have ate it up. So you're hoping that, um, that people in, in Oklahoma, AT, TV fans, when you're talking about digging deep, whatever, younger kids, older people, whatever are, are enjoying what we're doing. And if one person enjoys it, hopefully two people, three people, and so on and so forth. But if one person enjoys what we're doing and the sport benefits from it, that's really all that matters. Yeah, for sure. And it's awesome when you'll get a, a random message from somebody, just like you said, I did to you. Mm-hmm. I remember, I, I remember clear as day, I messaged you. I said, Hey man, I've never listened to podcasts, but I just did. And this is awesome. I'm hooked. And, uh, and I, ever since, you know, I've listened to all of them. Um, Oh, and another thing that was cool is listening to one of your episodes. I got brought up and I'm like, wow, that 10 years, people are still talking about 10 years ago Mm -hmm. and kind of like, it made me smile. Like that's cool (laughs) that people remember me and, and, uh, still talk about it. Well, yeah, I think you made an impact. You made an impact more than I think you you realize you did, you know? Yeah, Um, for sure. And that's why I kind of wanted to be able to tell this story because like, I I think, I don't know if I said it after we, after we hit record on this thing or before, but I think people would have fell out of their rocker, um, you know, knowing that somebody, cause everybody, you know, Joel has went on to be a legend of the sport and all these things. Um, but you battled him hard in pro-am you beat him in the one class you battled him hard for rookie of the year and the rookie season there it was like the two rookies it wasn't just one rookie coming into the pro class and and you know making waves it was both of you so um people that are you know maybe new to the sport now they might they might not know you and now you know we're bringing your name up again and they're going to kind of know this story and maybe they'll go back they can, you can go on youtube and watch the atv 24 7 videos or whatever they're called um that season was well documented your rookie season there so you can go watch that whole thing out there and kind of relive those races as new and that's pretty cool especially after we record this podcast here hey your name's not going anytime anywhere soon pal you're 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 here to stay yeah, that's that's funny because uh, even when you posted the the post earlier about me being on here, yeah, I was I was really busy at work and my phone just kept going off in my pocket. And finally, when we closed the store down, I look at it and I had like 
15, 20 new followers on Instagram. Oh, really? <laughs> what the heck? And then I realized it's because when you made that post, people were oh, seeing sure. it, and then they're sure. going to follow me. Mm-hmm. And probably, you know, some of them don't even know who I was if they're new into the scene yeah. or some that did from back then. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I like when you have Bryce Ford on here. Okay. Because he, me and him, uh, 2011, he was a mini rider at TQRA. Okay. And so he kind of looked up to me and I always watched him and his brother and, um, it was, it's cool to see what they've both done now. And, and, uh, I'll never forget at Dallas Supercross. That's our local one. Mm -hmm. This past year, I saw Bryce in, in the pits and he literally like turned his head, like he didn't see me and walked the other way. And it was cause he was like kind of shy, like, Sure. Like he wanted to talk to me, but he went the other way, and I'm like, "Really?" And uh, because, because so that, he he remembered you as as you know the the big guy, big man on campus kind of thing from back in the day, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah, sure. So, I'm sure. So then, me and my wife went to Daytona this year for the Supercross. We okay. went to watch the bikes and stayed a couple of days. Stayed for the quad race. Okay. And um, I'm sitting in the stands, and I'm behind Ian and his daughter, you know, sitting there and she turns around she's like, Bryce is so excited. You're here. And I'm like, really? <laughs> she's like, yeah, but he, he won't come up and talk to you. And so I made a point to go after the race and go talk to him. And, and he kind of did the same thing. I'm like, Bryce, come over here. And I start talking to him and, yeah. and then I kind of like motivated him, you know, cause he had those issues there mm-hmm. and uh, kind of just gave him like a little pep talk, but Awesome. Really, I mean, the dude's killing it. So I felt like I I didn't really have to tell him much, but but it was cool that he looked up to me and was like noticed that I was there and mm-hmm. and it's crazy how how good he's doing now. And I remember when I was racing, he was just a little guy on a, on a fifty. Mm-hmm. It's so. it's funny, and I I've um I've heard or, or read or I can't remember how it all went down, but I remember. Um, Mrs. Ford giving you credit for, you know, you kind of being a, uh, you know, an idol, a mentor, whatever, however you want to say it for the boys over the years. And, uh, yeah, it's the same thing, you know, with me and, and some of those guys that are in the pro class now, like, like Brandon Hogue had stayed with me when he was a mini rider and, you know, on a 300 EX that was dilapidated and barely ran and whatever. And now, you know, he's one of the gnarliest guys out there, like any of these kids, it's just cool to, have watched the progress that they, that they made, you know, you remember Bryce on a CVT or whatever at local races. And now he's, you know, one of the baddest dudes and he still looks up to you like that. So, so that's kind of what I'm saying is I think that you made more of an impact than, than you even know. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's one thing that I think is a highlight of, of my career is, is having made an impact on people um, and people loving what I did basically. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I feel like I didn't have the biggest fan base, like Joel Hetrick definitely had way more fans than me, but I feel like the select few that were, were like diehard fans Die hard. and yeah. just loved it. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, man, as we, uh, as we finish up here, I'm just so stoked to, to share this story. Um, like I said, so many of us remember it like it was yesterday, but happy to set, shed some light on, on what I think is a unique and cool story for some people that may not remember it. So I'm just, uh, stoked to share your story, pal. This has been a blast. And, um, as far as your podcast goes, where can people find your work? Uh, pretty much just the same as yours. I mean, anywhere okay. where you can find a podcast, all, all the mean, podcast apps. Apple, yeah. Apple, Google, Perfect. Spotify, you know, Perfect. pretty much all of those. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, I think you're going to have, have came away from this with a lot of fans that you made and a lot of people that are going to want to listen to your stuff. So, uh, what we really need to do, what we really need to do, and you said you were at Daytona, but we need to get you to go to another one of these things. So then we can have you come on to help break down the race afterwards on one of our review pods. That's really what we need to do now. Yeah, that would be cool. I'd honestly like to be going to sunset because that was one of my favorite tracks and it's one of the closer ones to us. How about Loretta? Um, I would like to try to make that happen. I actually may be able to make that happen. Me and my wife actually went um, the last two years, they uh, 19, 18 and 19, 18, I believe. 19. Okay. Um, so and you, it was weird because a lot of people didn't even 
recognize <laughs> me and I kind of felt awkward. Because, yeah. Just, just wait yeah. though. Now it'll be different. Now it'll be different after some of these conversations. Yeah, and, for and sure. Kind of returned that, that dirt and brought it to the surface. Well, Hey man, if you can make it to one of those things, I'd love to, uh, to, you know, to have you come on and help us break down the races. That'd be a blast. Yeah, definitely. If I can swing it, I'd love to. Loretta's is, was, is probably one of the, the highest chances of me making one just because it's kind of when our, our busy time slows down and it's and not, you know, too crazy far away. So. Close, close ish. Yeah. Right. Awesome, man. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I look forward to, uh, to working together on some, some projects here in the future, like we referenced. And, um, I always enjoy these talks because, uh, like I said, you were somebody that I really looked up to all those years ago and I just can't thank you enough for doing this. This has been so much fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah. And until next time, you're the man. That's Chase Snap brought to you by our friends at SSI Decals. Head over to SSIDecals.com today for all your needs when it comes to graphics, decals, vinyl, and so much more. Thanks again, pal. Take care. Yep, you too. What a great guy. Looking forward to getting him back on to talk some more current racing in the near future. Major thanks to tonight's guest, Chase Snap. Thanks to producer Dallas Jansen, my brother. Thanks to Brooke and AMA official Harv Whipple. Thanks to our sponsors, CST Tires, shop.csttires.com. Yamaha, thanks to Blue Crew, Valvoline, SSI decals, DID Racing Chain, Namira Technologies, Bronco ATV and UTV components, Launderville Steel Enterprises and Concrete Supply, Impact Solutions, Forworks Carbon, DP Brakes, Script Gloves, Factory 43, Bike Strikes and Quads LLC, and Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with code DIGGINGDEEP20 at manscaped.com. Support the brands that support our show, and don't forget to use those codes to save. Find it all on our website, and be sure to click that Rocky Mountain ATVMC banner for all your gear and parts needs, and to help us out in a major way. And most of all, thanks to you guys for listening. Our show merchandise, including Digging Deep shirts and hoodies, our Quad Guys Get Hot Chicks shirts and hoodies, back-to-back National Champ merch, and more are all available at shop.diggingdeepatvmx.com. If you're looking for another easy way to help support us, visit our website site and click the buy me a coffee button. This allows you to set up a one-time or monthly contribution to support our efforts. You can call our voicemail line anytime, 920-569-3519, and follow the show on social media, Digging Deep ATVMX Podcast, and myself, Cody Jansen, for additional content, Digging Deep ATVMX Fantasy Info, and more as racing continues to heat up. A reminder that lineups do not roll over, so head over to ATVFantasy.com right now to select your team and lock it in up until one hour before Moto One this Saturday. So that's 12.30 local time, 12.30 central time. Thanks to all of you who are playing. This has been so much fun. Digging Deep ATV MX Fantasy is such a hit. As for the podcast, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. Wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the Digging Deep ATV MX podcast. All episodes, additional podcast providers, sponsor links, and discount codes, our new show merchandise, fantasy info, and more can all be found on our website, diggingdeepatvmx.com, so check that out today. Be a friend, tell a friend. Please download, subscribe, rate, review, and share. And with that, for Chase Snap, Brooke Catherine, Dallas Jansen, and I'm your host, Cody Jansen, thanks for listening to the number one podcast in ATV Racing, 2 million downloads and counting. Until next time, thanks for joining us and digging deep with the stars of ATV motocross. Now let's go racing. See you next week. Things are crashing and burning here at the Digging Deep podcast, much like the Titanic. Those guys were hauling ass for real. I remember watching Doug Gus, I don't know who it was, Steel City, running the same times Friday afternoon as James Stewart was on Sunday back then. It was mental. I've never seen quads go that fast. Quad leaders are freaking gnarly.